Welcome to the home meat cutting series and the fish processing video, Process Like a Pro. Whether you're just back from your favorite fishing spot or your local fish market, you'll find that by using proper techniques, it will assure you a nicer meal on your dinner table and a better trophy on your wall. Plus the satisfaction of knowing that it was done right. Today, your video meat cutter, Brent Evans, and award-winning taxidermist, Bill Cook, will be taking you through step-by-step -step instructions. So here's Brent to get you started. Hi, I'm Brent Evans and welcome to the Home Meat Cutting Series. Today, I'd like to show you how to process your fish like a professional. We'll cover everything from special filleting techniques to how to cut larger fish into steaks and roasts. Let's go to work. It's important to keep your fish alive as long as possible. Once it dies, dress it and get it on ice. If you're out fishing, it's gonna be a few days until you can get home to get your fish in the freezer. Here's a good idea. Take some regular ice cream salt, rock salt, put a couple handfuls in your ice chest with some ice. This will lower your temperature down to about 28 degrees. Keeps your fish colder and of course fresher until you can get them home and freeze them. Don't let your fish swim in ice water. Drain your tank, keep it on ice. First, I'd like to show you how to do a trout small bones, they can be the hardest to fillet. I'd like to show you this little trick where you cut along the backbone, the tip of your knife breaking through those ribs all the way to the end of the cavity. Then you go back and you do the other side the same way, again to the end of the cavity. Take your knife, pushing down towards the ribs or the backbone itself, make your cut all the way to the tail. Next cut, applying pressure against the back itself all the way through. Again, place your knife, get tilted towards the bone, come back, Take the tail, cut it away from the skin and the meat, lift it up to the head, take the head off with the collar. You want to take the collar off too. There's the backbone. For the ribs, you want your knife to cut the same direction as the ribs are turned. Use the whole blade of your knife with the blade again tilted towards the bone. The other side, same way. Ribs pointing this way, you want your knife to go the direction of the ribs. like that. You have your dorsal fin that's in between the two fillets. You cut along each side of it. Taking that off. Bottom fins. And there you have it. Nice fillet. Next we're going to show you some field dressing techniques. This is a Mackinac. You want to start at the vent Cut all the way up to the gill. Take your knife. You'll see on the lower jaw, there's a piece of thin skin there. Take your knife, go all the way across, cutting that away from the jaw itself. Larger fish, you've got to be careful about sticking your finger in their mouths because they have teeth. Grab hold of that. Give her a pull. The gill. And all the intestines, these are the kidneys. You want to get that out. Again, hold on to his jaw. It's best to take your nail Now I've taken it to the sink and cleaned the cavity out. We're going to fillet it. Same way we did the trout. These bones are a little bit bigger.
but you can still fairly easily cut through them. Again, back to the cavity. Other side, same way. Next, take your knife, tilting towards the bone, make your cut all the way back to where the cavity stops. With the blade tilted towards the backbone, next cut along the backbone, other side the same way. Again with your blade tilted towards the bone, cut all the way down to the tail. Lift up the backbone, cut underneath it away from the skin, pull it up towards the head, take the head off, take your knife, going the direction the bone's going, use your entire blade, Other side the same way. Bones going this way. With the knife tilted towards the bones. You have your dorsal fin bones here. You want to cut each side of the dorsal fin up along the side of it. Cut that away. And there you have it. Two nice fillets. Take them over to the sink, give her a good washing, we're ready for the frying pan. On your ocean running fish, where they need to be scaled or skinned, I'd like to show you a little technique. Bring your fish home, make sure he's nice and clean. On scaling, it seems to be easiest if you use a broad knife or a scaler. This is a messy job. Just get that knife underneath them scales. This is a job you actually want to do at the pier or in the boat. You bring them home, you're just going to make somebody mad at you. Because there's no easy way of keeping these scales from flinging all over everything. Really not a lot to it. Now, of course, you want to take him over to the sink and give him a washing off. Now I'd like to show you how to fillet this. You'll do this a little different than you would a trout. First thing you want to do Get a knife for the job. This fish is a little bit broader. Cut underneath the dorsal fin, all the way to the head. Next, you want to take the tip of your knife, stab down, you'll feel the ribs, your knife will stop. Of course, be careful. Saw. All the way down until you can't feel any more rib. Again, take your knife, being careful, stick it all the way through the fish. Knife tilted towards the bone. Next cut, right along the bone there. The backbone here you have to go around it. Follow the ribs, again keeping your knife tilted. There you have your fillet. So you won't get as nice as a fillet, but it is awful nice and thick. On the other half of this fish, I'll show you something a little different. I haven't taken the scales off this side. First you want to take this belly off down here these fins. Cut to the top. Important to have a sharp knife for filleting. Take the knife, cut along the backbone. the 
end of the rib. Again, bring your knife through. Down around the bone. With your knife tilted towards the bone. Like I mentioned before, I didn't scale this half. I'm going to show you how to take the skin off it. Lay the fish skin down, make a small cut with the knife towards the skin, with your finger holding onto the skin, your knife turned down, there you have your skinless fillet. Now I'd like to show you a few different techniques on skinning catfish. We've cut around its head just through the skin. Next, you barely want to scribe along the backbone, just through the skin. We've already taken his insides out. Along the bottom fin the same way. Next, you'll need a pair of pliers. Get it started. Catfish can be tough. They're also a real hardy fish, but they're one of the best eaten fish there is too. Take your time trying not to rip the flesh. You have to watch these front fins. Anybody who's been fishing for catfish knows they can be fairly dangerous. because They are stiff and sharp. These barbs can really hurt if you're not careful. So what we've done here, we've pulled that skin off. I'll show you on the other side. Again, I'm cutting down along the dorsal fin and backbone. Bottom fin, just through the skin. If you have a hard time holding on to these fish, sometimes I'll use a the clipboard cutting board like this one where I can pinch the fish, his tail or head, keeps it from wiggling around. If you don't have one, I've also used a nail and nailed the head to a board. Catfish are hard to cook whole, you usually have to take off their head. Again, with a large knife, place your hand over the tip, bear down on the handle, take the dorsal fin off. This also has a barb on it you have to be careful with. They're a little easier to fry like that, or if you need to, you can fillet them. Start at the top, work down the backbone. Again, poke down the ribs until you've passed the ribs and go all the way through. Catfish have a wide rib cage. Other side the same way, down the backbone. Poke the tip of your knife till you don't feel the rib any longer. All the way through. Tilt the blade of your knife towards the rib. Take off that fin. Some of the best freshwater fish you can eat. Here's another technique. Start the same way, up towards the head, being sure to stay away from those barbed fins. Cut all the way through to the backbone. Next, with the tip of your knife, start at the cut that you've made by the head, all the way down the backbone along the dorsal fin. Keep pounding or keep sticking your knife in the end until you can't feel the ribs any longer. Drive your knife through 
tilt your knife down towards the blade, or tilt your knife down towards the backbone. Tilt your knife down towards the backbone, all the way to the tail. Next, cut down around the ribs. Again, with your knife tilted towards the rib bones. The other side, make your cut by the head all the way through. Take your knife along the backbone into the rib. When you can't feel the rib any longer, bring your knife through, tilt it down towards the bone. Towards the rib. Next, you want to take the skin off. Lay the flay flat with your fingernail. Hold down the skin or the flay so it won't move. Make a slight cut. Holding onto the skin, slide that knife between the skin and the and the, and the flay itself, knife tilted down. This is where the clipboard comes in handy. Take off any fins. Again, fingernail into the back of the fillet. Slide your knife underneath the fillet. There's your fillets. Now I've pulled the skin off with a pair of pliers. I'll show you how to get the fillet off. You can see where the knife stops at the rib cage. And it goes all the way through, knife tilted down, all the way to the tail. Next thing to do, tip your knife, follow the ribs, tilting the end of it towards the rib themselves. Again, Along the rib cage, the rib of a catfish isn't very long. Tilting the blade of your knife towards the bone, you're better off taking that bottom fin off. Pulling the fillet up. Fall the bone down. You'll find it easier if you cut with the direction the ribs are going. If they're pointing back, you want to cut towards the back. Okay, now I'd like to show you how to make steaks out of the salmon. Start up towards the head right in the back of the collar. Place your hand on the end of your knife. You need a long knife, fairly heavy blade. Save the head for chowder if you'd like. Turn the fish up. Here on the dorsal fin, place your knife just below it. Back fin. Now we've taken the head off and removed the dorsal fin and the bottom fins. Take your knife, make a cut to the backbone.
Make nice smooth cuts so you don't have jagged meat. We're going to leave a nice little roast on the end of this. Take the tail off. You could use this for a fillet if you'd like. Going down the backbone the same way. Because there's not a lot of rib bone in there, they make an, an awful nice fillet. But for this one, we're going to make a roast out of it. Hi, I'm Kevin, and today I'm going to teach you how to process salmon like a pro. As you can see, I've got my gloves on and we're ready to go. Over here we've got some really nice salmon. As you can see, this is a store-bought salmon. Basically, when you're getting any kind of a store-bought fish, one of the most important things that you're looking for is freshness best way to tell if a fish is fresh is if it's got a nice sheen to it. The scales are all firmly attached. Another way of telling if your fish is fresh, if you can get your hands on it, is by checking the gills. If the gills have got a nice bright reddish color, then that is a nice quality fish. If the gills are starting to turn a lighter pink or a grayish brown, then you know that that fish is getting a little bit old. Uh, one really easy way is looking at the eyes. If the eyes are cloudy or if the eyes are recessed and not uh, poking out a little bit, that's also a sign of an older fish. You can look at the scales. The fish should have a really nice sheen to it. The scales should all be firmly attached to the fish. If the scales are loosening up or coming off, then that also is an indication that the fish is not that fresh. And uh, of course the age-old method is by smell. If you can smell the fish, then uh, it's definitely uh, not too good because fish takes a long time for it to start to get an odor. And once it does start to get an odor, it's on its way out. And uh, you can see the nice, beautiful color. You always want to try and make sure that you wash the cavity out as best you can because the uh, insides of the fish have a tendency of spoiling much quicker than the actual fish. So you want to make sure that you clean all of that out so that you don't get any kind of a bacteria buildup in there that would cause your whole fish to spoil on you. One of the first things I'd like to go over with you is knife safety. Always want to use the sharpest knives that you possibly can and you always want to cut away from your hand. That's one of the most important things because whenever you're cutting towards your hand there's much more risk of injury and a very serious cut. Uh, whenever you're cutting meat, you want to use uh, the best quality tools that you can. The uh, tools really help make the job much, much easier. And uh, I think we'll go ahead and start here. Okay, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to remove this upper fin. You want to make it a nice smooth stroke. You want to get as little meat as you possibly can. There's also a rear fin here that we want to remove. There's a lower fin here towards the tail. We remove that. Notice how I'm grasping the fish, trying to keep a nice firm grip on it so that it doesn't slip out of your hands. There are these two front fins here. I'm cutting this away from me so it's a little bit awkward. I always take those off a little bit larger. You can use those for chowder. And then when you come across through the head here, what you want to do is you want to come right behind this fin and right behind the gills, straight cut, press down on the front of the knife, press down on the handle of the knife. You can hear it going through that bone there. Come through, you got to go around this fin. I'm going to turn it towards me. It lays a little bit flatter and this part of the fish where it has been gutted has a tendency of rolling forward on you. You always want to remember to cut away from your hand, hold the front of the knife, press down, and follow through. This gives you a nice even steak. You want to cut your steaks as evenly as you possibly can get them to ensure that they're all going to be done at the same time. One's not going to be done before the other one. 
This is a nice five to seven pound fish here. As you can see, we're yielding quite a few steaks off of it. Remember, you want to come down through until you hit that backbone and just push right down on it. You have to exert some pressure because you're trying to break through that center bone there. See the fish is sliding a little bit. I like to keep a towel next to me so I can wipe it up. You always want to make sure that your area is dry and flat. When you come through, this is the tail part of the fish. When you come through, I like to fillet this. I generally leave the tail on. It gives you a better grip. You can just bring your knife through, catch the, that backbone right there. Just follow it straight up and follow just right through. Gives you a nice fillet there. Turn it over and it's lying flat. Makes it even easier yet. Just come right through on it. And there you have two beautiful fillets. You cut your tail off the same way you cut your steaks. Hold the front of your knife and come down on it. And then you have this nice piece here that you can use for some chowder. And out of that fish, we got eight steaks, two beautiful fillets. Fillet this salmon, process it like a pro. First, I'd like to talk a little bit about knife safety. I'm going to use two knives for this. I've got a 10-inch serrated knife here, and I've got a 6-inch bony knife. There's two different kinds of bony knives. There's a flexi and there's a stiff, and I like to use the stiff because it's, for me, it's a little bit safer. You want to make sure that you always keep your tools away from you, keep your tools together, and also keep the blade away from you so that it, in case you're grabbing for it and you do miss the handle, that basically all you're going to do is catch the back of the knife here, which is safe. Now what we're going to do is we're going to start off with the 10 inch serrated knife. And what we're going to do is we're going to take off the fins. You want to see how I have a nice firm grip on the fish here. You want to come right through and remove that fin. You want to make sure that you get as little meat as possible. We're going to remove this one the same way. You just want to come right straight across, lay your knife flat on the meat, and just bring your knife right straight across. And you can see that you're not really tearing into the, the steaks or the fillets. We'll remove this fin here to make it a little bit easier to fillet for us. When you remove the head, you want to come right behind this fin. You want to angle your knife a little bit. You can see that I've started the cut. And you want to try and come in towards the top of the head here to leave as little meat as possible in the head. Put your hand on the front of the knife and press down. You can hear it cracking the vertebrae there. And then you're going to come back through, come right around the gills and the fins and then you remove the head with relatively little to no loss. Another use for this is also you can use that for a chowder. Now that I've done that, I always like to keep a towel handy next to me, maybe a little bit damp. Make sure that you wipe your handle so that the next time you come back to use the knife, you're not going to have any fish residue on it and it won't have a tendency of slipping out of your hand. Now basically what we're going to do is we're going to replace the the, the 10 inch knife with this bony knife. What I'm going to do is I'm going to come in through here and the vertebrae. What you have to actually do is you have to actually cut right through these ribs here. I'm going to start here more towards the center because you're actually cracking the bone. You want to make sure that your hands are out of the way. What you really want to do is you want to come through here and you want to get your knife in here. You notice I'm starting towards the middle of the fish and you want to crack through these bones. You have to exert a fair amount of pressure on that, so you want to make sure that you have a good grasp on the fish. Then I'm going to turn my knife away from me and finish going through this other side here. You can possibly hear them cracking. And then you want to just run your knife right down the vertebrae there. Okay. And we're going to come right up through the center here and right down the tail. You can feel the bone there. You can see the bone there. And you can come right down like this and cut it right straight through. Now, if you don't remove that upper fin, 
you have a little bit of a hard time, here's part of that upper fin right here, you'll have a little bit of a hard time separating your fillet from the bone. And then we'll put this up here for right now. You can see that you still have a little bit. You can just come right through and very easily trim this off. On this piece here, we'll just come underneath it. Notice you're going to put your hand in behind the knife. You always want to cut away from yourself and away from your hands. You're going to gently glide your knife blade right across the top of the meat. And you can see how it just peels right away like that. And then you get down here towards the lower part and it's a very thin, skinny anyway. And then you can just come right straight through and cut it off. This piece here you can use for a chowder. As you can see there's not a lot of waste on there and there's enough meat to give some chowder some seasoning. And then you wind up with a really beautiful fillet. Put this over here. To come back and finish this other side, you're going to use the same process. You want to come in the bone here. You want to just use the tip of the knife to cut through that initial bone. You can see that it's a little bit difficult. Notice I'm cutting away from myself with just the tip. You don't want to apply too much pressure and you don't want to go in too far because you'll gouge the fillet. And then you want to come in like this and come straight down that vertebra one more time. Cut around the tail here and then just follow that bone all the way down. And then off. And then you want to come right down the front of this again. Move this out of my way. Sometimes you can't always cut away from your hand. It's impossible. So what you want to do is you want to make sure that your fingers have got a firm grip that you're not going to slip and that you're guiding your edge down away from your fingers and not towards your hand and come straight across. And there you've got it. Two nice fillets with a fairly minimal amount of loss. And here's video taxidermist Bill Cook. Hi, my name is Bill Cook. I'm from uh, Sparks, Nevada and I'm a fish uh, specialist. And I mount uh, a lot of trophy uh, cold water fish and warm water fish, pretty much a little bit of everything. Uh, I've won a lot of uh, awards at state and national and uh, world levels and uh, kind of been around a little bit and I'm going to try to show you the finer points on uh, taking care of a trophy fish, whether it's uh, for a reproduction or a skin mount. Uh, these uh, processes we're going to show you are real simple and uh, they should work out real good and give you a real nice finished uh, product at the end. So we'll go ahead and get right into it. Okay, uh, after you catch your fish and you land the fish, you want to go ahead and take your uh, photographs as soon as possible before the fish loses any color. Uh, and once you get, uh, get to shore and get your fish landed, you're going to end up having to kill the fish because this salt, uh, I mean, it, you don't want to put salt on anything that's living because it's just going to stress it out big time and it's just not a good thing to do. Uh, and it, which it can affect the color pattern in there if the fish gets too stressed. So one, what you want to do after your photographs is you want to uh, stun the fish. I just use a sawed off uh, short end of a broom handle or anything like that and you want to hit the fish right on the top of the head where the scales in and the top of the head uh, turn smooth. It's just back uh, a little ways behind the eyes right in this area right here. And if you just hit them and you want to try to hit them once and hit them hard. Uh, and don't worry about that little area getting damaged. And you'll know when you do it right because almost all the fins are just going to straighten right out and you'll know. 
uh, and then just give it a few uh, minutes after that and get into the salting process. And also you can see that this fish, even though it does have an indentation there, this fish hasn't been gutted. Uh, if you're going to ha have your fish mounted and it is a skin mount, uh, don't ever gut the fish. Don't do anything to it other than salting it and getting it uh, frozen and, and packaged up right. Uh, you just leave the rest of that up to the taxidermist because uh, we do different incisions all over and uh, it just may, it causes a lot of problems. Uh, if you do gut one or, or you already did do it and it's in the freezer and you want it mounted, it can be dealt with, but uh, it is a lot of work. So definitely don't gut the fish, don't take out any of the gills or anything like that and just keep the, the fish in just one whole piece is a really way to go about it. This here is a skin mount. It's a cutthroat out of a lake. And basically what we do here is you want to uh, take a photograph of your fish uh, right after you catch it. I mean within minutes hopefully if you can do that. Uh, and then once you get the fish landed and take your photograph, uh, you want to go ahead and lightly salt the fish, just regular good old Morton salt or whatever your store carries, and you just want to lightly sprinkle it. You don't need to, you can't really put too much on, but you don't need to kind of overdo it. So if you just get just a light coat like that, and one area here that you really, I want to point out to you, this is one of the main ones, is right under here under the pectoral fin. Uh, this fish was never salted and you can see what happened right here. All the, it loses all the color in the skin from the fin laying up against there. So you want to make sure and get salt on both sides of that fin. And that will keep that from happening. Uh, that's kind of one of the real bad areas there, so really make sure you get it on both sides. And you can put a little bit up here in the gills and on the head and in the mouth a little bit. And go ahead and turn it over and make, sh make sure you get both sides here. That looks pretty good. And that should just about do it there. So it's just a real light coating and basically what that does is the, uh, the salt, uh, when it mixes in with the uh, slime that's on the fish, the uh, pH factor of the fish is real close to what it was in the water, which keeps it from losing color and uh, getting any of these fade spots and uh, picking up any of those light spots where the fins uh, lay up against the body. Or if you set it on your tailgate or something and it has the little lines in it, and you, I'm sure you guys have seen that where that's happened. So this will eliminate all that. And uh, I would say really the best thing that this does, it not only helps preserve the fish, but it locks in all the color. So if you take your photograph right away, and then put this salt on it after you kill the fish. Uh, it will lock all that color in so that when uh, a taxidermist like myself goes to paint it, we're just actually going to tint the fish with color rather than trying to opaque the whole thing out or have to put uh, a lot of white on it to cover up all those mistakes uh, from not salting it. So if you do it that way, uh, we just basically will tint the fish and you'll come out with a real uh, super trophy. And as far as uh, packaging the fish in your freezer, this salt, if you, uh, once you salt it, if you put it in a plastic bag and just keep it out of the sun or in a cooler, it doesn't uh, necessarily have to be frozen. But if you keep it uh, out of the sunlight and uh, fairly cool, it'll last uh, for a few days like that so you don't have to worry about you know, rushing right back to the uh, freezer. You can, this will just help kind of protect the tail. Uh, this is kind of just optional, it's not that big of a deal. Because once this fish is frozen uh, and all the fins are laying up against the body, it, it's pretty hard to hurt it unless it's really thrown around in the freezer quite a bit. But it, I would say the tail is probably the most vulnerable. So you can just cut out a couple quick pieces of cardboard here. And you can just uh, go ahead and set, set this cardboard on either side. Uh, and run a couple staples through it. Make sure you don't staple through the tail. Don't get, don't get in there too deep, but just on the edge, just a couple of them, just to kind of hold it into place there. Just something like that.
Now I kind of use these little, these uh, bags here, they're kind of extra heavy duty. So they're a little bit better as far as strength and everything like that. So I'd recommend maybe using the little stronger bag if you can. And this particular size you can get just right, get this fish just fits right in the bottom there. Just perfect. And you want to make sure your uh, bag is airtight just so you don't get any freezer burn. Normally I'll just go ahead and keep that tail flat and then just roll this up. And you can use pretty much any type of tape, but as long as you get that thing sealed in there, pretty good. Uh, it just will keep all that air out of there so you don't have to ever worry about getting any freezer burn. And it'll probably keep that fish good for, I've done them where they've been two years old, but you'd probably like to get it to your taxidermist right away and uh, let him get it into his freezer and everything. But it would be fine, uh, you know, for at least a year or so without any problem. So that should take care of that as far as the skin mount goes. Um, as far as uh, reproduction fish go, if you're thinking of having one uh, done for you, if you want to turn your fish loose or whatever, uh, take a real good uh, photograph of that fish, maybe a few of them since you're not going to be keeping it, and you want to measure the girth and the length of the fish and uh, write that stuff down so that your taxidermist has it because if he doesn't have a blank he can go ahead and get get a hold of one and then the uh, photographs of course are real valuable as far as getting the color real close to what you remember that you caught um, if it is a fish that you acquired or it is a dead fish or the fish died and you're going to give it to the uh, taxidermist to cast off of it you could probably uh, I wouldn't recommend salting the fish because it will uh, leave some marks on it and it'll come out in the cast so it might not be as good of a cast if you do it that way so I would eliminate it as far as that goes if you're just going to go for a straight reproduction but on a skin mount this is a real simple way and it's cheap uh, and it'll take care of your fish and give you that much you know nicer of a job this technique here too also will work on any fish warm water cold water fish uh, even saltwater fish occasionally, but uh, it will work on any fish so you don't have to worry about using anything else. Well, there you have it. Uh, that's a real cheap and inexpensive way to take care of your uh, trophy fish. And uh, you won't have to worry about any of the problems that we showed you. So go out there and catch as many as you can. <laughs> and good luck fishing. And here's Patrick to show you how to keep an edge on your knife. Hi, my name is Patrick Davis, and today I'm going to go run through on how to sharpen a knife. A few things to determine first whether the knife needs to be sharpened or not. If it doesn't need to be sharpened, don't sharpen it. Every time you're sharpening a knife, you're removing material from it, which decreases the life of the knife. Easy way to test it, there's a few ways to testing it. An easy way to test it is to go ahead and drop it in the back of your thumb on your nail. If it sticks, therefore it's sharp. Another way of testing it is the hair test kind of come up and see if it takes your hair off. If it takes your hair off, it's pretty sharp then. If it's not sharp, there's a several ways of sharpening it. The traditional way of doing it is working it onto a stone. The way you usually bring it onto a stone is taking the blade, putting it at a 23 degree angle, and then drawing it into the blade. Don't draw over the back of the blade because you're going to put a burr onto it. Draw it into the blade. Why a 23 degree angle? A 23 degree angle is a compromise between everything pretty much. What happens is, if you have a real steep angle, something like this, you have very little material at the tip of the blade to support the rest of it. It is very sharp to start with, but then as time goes on, it becomes very dull. It'll bend, it'll break, it'll deform. If you have a very wide angle, something like this, you end up having a very moderately sharp blade, but it'll stay sharp a whole lot longer than a very narrow blade. Compromise, 23 degrees. How do I know it's 23 degrees? Well, basically, it's a guesstimate almost. A couple ways of doing it. They have these little items uh, with a lot of the sharpening kits now. What you do, you place it onto your block or your oiling stone, set it about there, and then draw on through. And there you go. There's your 23 degrees. Well, I don't have one of these things. Well, it's not so important that it be 23 degrees as it is to be consistent with the angle at all times. What happens is, like I was demonstrating before, you have something like this. You want it to be very very consistent.
You don't want something like this or like this or anything else because what will happen, the knife will not stay as sharp or as long, sharp as long as it should be. That's why you use this. If you don't have a 23 degree angle wedge, what you go ahead and do, now this is what I do at least, find what's comfortable. Something about, oh, inch or so off the ground there. Place your finger on there. And remember where your finger is placed on the blade compared to the stone. And then just draw it on through like so. You're going to draw through a few times this way. When you flip it over, comparably have it on the thumb side too. Then you go ahead and you draw through. Pretty simple. Yeah, well, it kind of takes a little practice to do. As far as the stones are concerned, this is what they call a multiple stone. You have the medium, coarse, fine, super fine, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. One thing you want to do whenever you're using a stone, you want to have some sort of liquid on it. Let it be oil, let it be saliva, let it be water. The reason why you want to have oil or water or saliva on the stones is to lift the medical particles out of the stones so they remain porous. If they do not remain porous, it's like going over glass. It's not going to do anything or it's going to do it very, very fine. Uh, they sell these sporting oils and everything else like that. I use kitchen oil, like a, any type of oil or a saliva would be fine. Just a little bit. Take your finger. Actually, that's probably a little too much. Got jeans. You wipe it in your jeans. Come through. And so what you want to do is do it consistently. A lot of people set it up in one direction and just do that five, six times. After about maybe five, ten strokes either way, go back and check your blade again. Is it sharp? Well, it's getting there. Is it sharp? If it is sharp, stop. Don't destroy your knife. A few things, little tricks about sharpening when you sharpen a knife. Usually when you're using a knife, this section right in here, the base, is where all your heavy cutting going through. You're going to be cutting a lot. I usually keep that about 23 degrees, maybe a little bit broader because I want it to stay sharper longer. You may have noticed when I was coming through on this, I drop my point down just a little bit to bevel out the top to get a little steeper angle. Reason being, usually on your tip you can do a lot of fine cutting and you want it to be a little bit sharper. You're coming into a piece of paper, or you're cutting into uh, an animal or something of the sort, you want to penetrate the skin. You want it to be very sharp so it's kind of like a razor going right through. So ideally, you want one half of it to be about normal and usually the tip in this part right here where it starts to curve to be a little bit more of a, an angle. There are other methods to sharpening a knife besides using an Arkansas stone or, maple or a marble or something of the sort. This is what they call diamond. It's actually industrial diamond embedded onto metal. It is great. It puts a very fine edge on your material very quickly. Don't, you don't have to use oils. Just use saliva or whatever else or water. We have little water spigots we put on here. Be warned though, this takes a lot of material off the knife very quickly, which is something you always have to be aware of. If you want a knife that you spend $50, $60, $100 on a knife, you don't want it to last 5, 10 years. You want it to last a lifetime and maybe your next generation too. Exact same system as far as sharpening goes. Just come in, the same angle. It may not feel very rough or anything, but it does not have to. You also notice it's red. Oh, they have red, blue, green, orange, fuchsia, pink, all sorts of colors. All this is is a base plastic that allows the diamond to be embedded on too. Don't be aware about it. These will wear a whole lot longer than a standard stone will. Simple, it's diamond, it's a very hard surface. You will wear them out. I've seen people use chisels and items like that. They just go through these like they're cakewalk. If you have a very hard steel or you're doing chisels or something of that sort, go out when you go to a diamond, it'll save your Arkansas stones quite a bit of wear. Another system that's very popular is porcelain. Porcelain was used, is, has been used for hundreds of years. And the reason why is at the turn of the century and before that, they used to make porcelain pots. Or at least they have iron lined the porcelain on the outside. And what the women used to do to sharpen their knives, they turn the pot over and they take their chef's knife, sit there, and sharpen on the back of the porcelain. And it puts a very fine edge onto there. This is a great finishing tool and a great um, maintenance tool as far as doing that. Putting an edge that's very dull, it's not all that great, but it's a great way of putting a very fine edge on there after you use your stone. It's one step above a stone usually. Easiest way to go ahead and work it. Very simple. These are already set at 23 degrees, like your knife should be set at. There's also another setting here for 11 and a half, depending if you want to be eccentric or not. All you do, it's like you're cutting a piece of like you're cutting a piece of meat. You draw straight down like this, and straight down like this. Don't run it through the center here where the V is. That will end up dulling it more than it will be sharpening it. Just kind of go like that, just like almost like a steel. 
not the same principle, but very close to it. A lot of these also have two different types of um, porcelain set on there. They have a coarse, which is this right here, and they also have a fine. Uh, a lot of people use these in their kitchens. I use this in my kitchen for keeping my knives maintained. Another way of sharpening is using a steel. This has been used for many years. People believe it does actually remove material when it doesn't. What is actually happening is you're taking your knife and after using it for a period of time, the edge will start to bend up. What the steel does, the steel returns the edge to correct angle. It bends it straight. The proper way of using a steel is to go ahead, take the knife, why it's going away from you, don't bring it towards you. A lot of people, you see chefs bring it like this. We also see chefs with a lot of scars and missing knuckles. Bring it like this. Once again, you want to keep your 23 degree angle. One side, the other. Just like this. After a while, you get very quick with it. What same principle. You do not want to overdo this because it will start to remove material after a while and you end up over sharpening and dulling the knife. Very simple. Just one, two. It's a quick way of doing it. When you get rapid with it, you can't even see the knife moving. Probably the perfectionist way of sharpening a knife is what I call a multi-stone system. What that involves is you go ahead and you have a bracket set up like this. The knife is clamped into the bracket and, it, and there's several holes up on the side here. They vary in degree from 11 to 25 degrees. What you do is you have your stone, which is an arc, this is an Arkansas stone. They come in all sorts of exotic flavors, diamond and marble and everything else. And you place oil on it like you would anything else. I'm not going to do it for this one in particular. Then you select which angle. I'm going to go for 19 degrees like this knife is set at. And like anything else, you draw in towards the blade as so. What this is doing, it establishes an exact 19 degree angle. You do not have the human variance of your hand going like this all over it. Same thing. You go through, you do it a few times on this side. You flip the knife over. Once again, you have the diagram there. And you set this at 19 degrees and wah, it goes through. Most of the time, these are set in multi-varying systems. You have everything from very coarse to very fine. Uh, this is probably the perfectionist way of doing it if you're looking for an established angle. Nice thing about this, like I stated before, you have this, you want to have this angle beveled at the very tip of the knife. By using this, it does that naturally. Because you're so far off, the angle will decrease and you get more of an angle on it. Always remember, safety first. Keep the blade away from you whenever you're sharpening, you're cutting meat, you're gutting out a game. Keep the blade away so you do not hurt yourself. Thank you. My name is Patrick Davis, and I'll see you next time. Thank you for watching. We trust that you found this video both informative and interesting. Other titles include everything you'll need to learn to process your meat, poultry, and fish. Process like a pro. This is